So we're going to go ahead and welcome to the Children's Hours live stream on YouTube. I can't imagine anybody's joining us the very first second, but hello. So we're going to go ahead and welcome to the Children's Hours Ooh, live stream on YouTube. I can't imagine anybody's joining us the very first second, but hello. So we're going to go ahead and welcome to the Children's Hour. Okay. A funny thing happens when you zoom on and zoom and live stream to YouTube at the same time, you guys, you hear in your headphones yourself like delayed by 30 seconds. So it's quite confusing. <laughs> so I've muted that. Welcome to everyone who's coming to the Children's Hours live stream to Chaco Canyon, our virtual field trip. It's going to start in just a few minutes. I'm going to pop up here a little beautiful picture that I'm quite crazy about, and uh, I hope you are too. I think it's really beautiful to look at Chaco and all the different pictures that are there. I, I have lots and lots of them, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't put them all in one place to show you. But we'll be back with everyone in just a few minutes. We're about to start, and, um, and I'm quite grateful for all of you being here. Please be patient for just a minute. We're about to have the, the streaming start. If you have questions before we start this project and the Zoom today, you can actually pop them into the chat and we will have time for questions. That's all coming up. So hang in there. We're going to start in just a few minutes. We're going to let all the classes come in that want to come in and also the YouTube folks to be joining us on YouTube. And um, I'm, I hope that you are, uh, I hope you're ready for a really fun show. I'm going to play you a little music and we're going to start in just a second. You're listening to the Children's Hour. We are hearing Marlon Magdalena. He is a uh, historian who works at the Hamas Historic Site, and he's an educator up there. He's going to be with us today. He had a, a cancellation last minute, so we're, we're missing him, but we're thinking about him. Welcome to the Children's Hour's virtual field trip to Chaco Canyon. We are here today with two experts who you can see on the screen with me. Nathan Hadfield is the interpretive ranger at Chaco Canyon. He's the head interpretive ranger. And Mary Uyaki is an archaeologist at the Center for Archaeological Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I'm Katie Stone. I am the host and the producer of the Children's Hour. And this is episode two the beginning of episode two of our series called A Brief History of the American Southwest for Kids. And we're all so glad that you are all here with us. 
This program is supported by a generous grant from the New Mexico Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this publication program, oh, this is an exhibition and a program, do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the National or the New Mexico Humanities Council. And that is how we're going to start. Welcome to our guests. Welcome to all the kids who are watching right now. And let's start with Mr. Nathan Hadfield from Chaco Canyon. And Nathan, I'm going to pin you here so everyone can see you. Take it away. Well, good morning. It's so cool to reach out to students who are uh, maybe you know spread out all over the world so this is very exciting and i am a park ranger at chaco canyon and at aztec ruins national monument and chaco canyon is an amazing place it's not just a national park but it's also a world heritage site so people around the world have recognized that what we have in chaco canyon is so special and amazing if you come to Chaco Canyon, what you're going to see are giant monumental buildings. These buildings were four or five stories tall. They had several hundred rooms. These buildings were amazing and they were built over a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago, they didn't have tractors and tools like we have today. It was people using very simple tools to do amazing things. The biggest building in Chaco Canyon is called Pueblo Benito, and it is breathtaking. I really encourage all of you to go on the internet when you get home with mom and dad and Google Pueblo Benito, and you'll see just an amazing structure that was built with sandstone and mortar. It had a great big open plaza where they might have dances and different ceremonies. And it had several round spaces called kivas where they had special, very special sacred ceremonies as well. And this building, Pueblo Benito, along with other buildings in Chaco, they weren't just, uh, they were more than just buildings. They were monuments. When you think of a monument, you might think of the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., or the Lincoln Memorial, or some of the monuments that we hold very special for you know, American culture and American society. For the people who constructed the buildings in Chaco Canyon, they were doing the same thing. They were constructing monuments to their culture. And the modern Pueblo people today who are spread out all over New Mexico and the Four Corners area, they really see those buildings as some of the most sacred sites in the story of their people. And for their culture, places like Pueblo Benito and some of the other buildings in Chaco Canyon are still just so important, so special for uh, not just modern Pueblo people, but like I said at the very beginning, people all over the world have recognized that what we have in Chaco Canyon is very special. Now, very early on, archaeologists were finding things inside these old buildings, and they were finding things that were helping us learn about these different cultures. And they weren't just finding things that were from New Mexico or from the Four Corners area. They were finding things that came from very far away. So that tells us not only these people were these people building these amazing structures, but they were traveling great distances and bringing stuff from maybe as far as 500 miles away to Chaco Canyon. And I'm going to hold up a few things to give you some examples of some of the stuff that they made that they found in Chaco Canyon and Pueblo Benito and other buildings. So right here, this is a necklace. And it's made from shells that were found in the Pacific Ocean. Now, this is a reproduction, of course, but they found shells in Pueblo Benito and in other structures 
that were not from New Mexico. They came from great distances. And so this necklace and these beautiful shells were something that maybe someone brought into Chaco Canyon or maybe someone from Chaco traveled a great distance to bring this back into the canyon. So we found beautiful jewelry like this. Also jewelry that was made from turquoise. I know most of you probably know what turquoise is. It's a beautiful blue stone that was used to make jewelry. Another thing they found in Chaco Canyon that didn't come from the area were copper bells. These copper bells, again, these are a reproduction, but they would have come from great distances. They weren't made in Chaco Canyon, and these were probably used in ceremonies, much like modern Pueblo people use bells during their dances. They were probably doing the same thing in Chaco Canyon about a thousand years ago. So hold these up again, these very beautiful copper bells. Another thing that they found in Chaco Canyon, which I am so impressed with, they found burials of a very, um, a very special kind of bird. I'm going to hold up a picture of this bird. All right. This is a scarlet macaw. It's a beautiful bird that lives in tropical areas down near Mexico and what is now Central America. And these birds are very large and they're very colorful. As you can see, this, this particular macaw has some beautiful bright red feathers on its head. But they also had blue feathers and green feathers. These birds are absolutely gorgeous. And they found skeletons of scarlet macaws in Pueblo Benito. Now those birds, they don't live in New Mexico. They live in tropical wet areas, but somehow they made their way to Chaco Canyon. Someone probably brought it up or maybe someone traveled to the bird's home and brought it back. And what's special about these birds, not only are they colorful, but those birds can also mimic the human voice. They can talk. They can make sounds that sound very similar to human words. So I always imagine what it would be like to be in Chaco Canyon the day that the first scarlet macaw arrived. For people that lived in Chaco Canyon their whole lives, they were used to seeing ravens and maybe, uh, you know, crows and, and, and other birds. But then one day someone arrives not only with this huge colorful bird, but this bird can say words. How amazing could that be? I wish I was in Chaco Canyon on that day. Now, unfortunately, these scarlet macaws, they live in very warm tropical areas. And during the winters in New Mexico, they didn't do so well. So uh, in their natural environment, a scarlet macaw might live to be 40 or 50 years old. But in Chaco Canyon, remember, it wasn't their natural environment. They only lived to be about 15, 20 years old. But keep in mind, not only were these people amazing architects and builders, but they were also trading material things like the shells and the necklaces and the copper bells, but also bringing, you know, living things like the scarlet macaws into Chaco Canyon. It really was a thriving culture of people doing amazing things. And keep in mind, folks, this was a thousand years ago. So when you consider what they accomplished without modern tools and modern technology, it's pretty amazing and pretty special. And I hope someday all of you get a chance to come to Chaco Canyon. It really is a, a very amazing place. Thank you, Nathan. That is really great. Thank you. Um, you know, you, you bring up a lot of stuff, which is really important. One of which, the things that you bring up that I want to bring Mary Wiaki in here on is sort of this how incredibly uh, connected Chaco was to so many other places because clearly the shells couldn't have come to Chaco 
on their own walking across the desert. Somebody carried them and brought them all the way from the ocean. Somebody brought those macaws. Mary Wiaki, I'm going to introduce you to everyone. Uh, Mary Wiaki is an archaeologist at the Center for Ar for Archaeological Research up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Mary, Fill us in some more. What was happening? Chaco was one place and it was a beautiful, remarkable place that we who live in New Mexico can go see if we'd like. But there were there was a lot happening all around our region. Last time we talked to you, we were talking about footprints we found at White Sands that dated back 23,000 years now we're talking about a thousand years ago. That's some 20,000 years later. A lot must have happened in 20,000 years. So if you can, can you fill us in sort of around what was going on around Chaco? What led to Chaco? And then what happened with Chaco? There is, a, of course, that transition from when we were migratory and we were walking and leaving footprints, like you said, in White Sands, as well as other locations. And we were all trying to find a better place to become productive human beings. So um, um, Chaco um, was chosen again because of Fajada Butte and its spirituality. There's a butte that's in Chaco called Fajada Butte that has a calendar of solstice markers. And so they set this up so uh, they could know and understand transitions in uh, their surroundings, like uh, fall seasons, spring, summer, you know, when to plant, um, when was the best time to uh, celebrate. So uh, they were really fortunate to find Chaco. It had water. If you think about our landscape at that time, it was pretty flourishable, man. There was so much water, there were animals, there were uh, much more than you see today, which has become pretty much a desert, and that's climate change. Uh, climate change is affected by many, many things. Uh, at that time, um, they do write about it in some of the uh, codices or some of the rock art talks about a time where there was no water. So um, Chaco became an important center of religion. And this trade from all the way from South America and one of the big prizes of trade, if you guys, you kids out there, you have this sometimes that when it's cold outside and snowing and your mom goes in and she puts, you know, uh, milk or, or water and you mix it and you put these marshmallows in it. And I'm sure you know the name, it's called chocolate or cocoa. So cocoa is coming all the way into Chaco. And it's very special and only royalty can drink it. And they would ferment that cocoa in these beautiful cylinders or these, these jars that would hang from the, the beams, the Viga beams. And, you know, so this tells us that they were making contact uh, or bringing up trade of items all the way from South America. Of course, the Scarlet Macaw, like Nathan mentioned earlier, was a prized bird, they had cages out there. Um, so these, if you look at murals in certain kivas around, because you had peopling coming in from other tribes and uh, I've got the map I'm gonna show you real quickly. Um, that's the one I think. And this map was uh, uh, Barbara uh, Mills and her colleagues uh, designed this map. And you can see how many people were coming into Chaco and where their locations were. So all these little, uh, this triangular area, of course, is all the, the Pueblos within Chaco, the Great House, Pueblo Bonito, Quechcurro, you know. So you're getting all these uh, kivas and uh, post Chaco locations. So look, there's Gallup. Way over here in Arizona, we're coming in. We're coming in from Colorado. We're coming in from Utah. These highways, if you were to see an aerial map of Chaco, you'd see a roadway to the north and you would see this huge roadway to the south. So they're calling in all these other people to um, share their technology, their new ideas, there's new 
textile work coming in, there's new birds, there's new, um, you know, uh, designs for pottery that's coming in, all these ideas. And this is also a musical instrument. The one technology, because now you've settled, you've settled and you've got a place to stay for a while. You're no longer uh, carrying uh, your items around. You're actually um, uh, beginning to sit and I actually take all the technology that you've gathered from, you know, your mig migratory times and trade center areas, and you're creating um, pots that we didn't use before we had basketry. So now we're settling and you see this corrugated top, it's a special design because cooking on fire, uh, if you didn't have oven mitts, if you didn't have those kind of things, this acted as a uh, radiator cooler, the way your car does these little rigid areas. And you could actually pick this off of the fire with your bare hands. And so who's bringing in that technology? Who's teaching the Pueblo people all these wonderful things? So the corrugation gets even much more intricate and becomes a thing of beauty. Look how beautiful that is. So. This is somebody's little fingerprint going around and around and around and pressing the clay and making it possible to create a pot that you can take off the hot fire without using oven mitts. And it's gonna keep the whatever's being cooked in it hot and um, so it doesn't cool down fast. So the trade that's coming in and the ability to raise and, and have animals, uh, Nathan talked about the structure of Chaco. You see three different structural occupations there. The last one, uh, of course, there's a famous uh, terminology of the little tiny rocks inside the structures called Chaco chinks. That was still used in a lot of the modern Pueblos, but not, uh, not as concentrated when adobe structures come in. So when you go to Chaco, you see these beautiful rock structures, but remember they were plastered and they're being plastered with beautiful mud, you know, reds, yellows, uh, whites, color was very, a very beautiful thing to the Pueblo culture. That's why the scarlet macaw, like Nathan mentioned earlier, was sacred. Red's a sacred color, blue's a sacred color, white's a sacred color, black's a sacred color. So you have all these beautiful things happening there. The bells from the South, that was a prize. Shells become like money, seashells. So you have a, a distinctive trade route that coming in from San Diego, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana. And who are these travelers? Who are these people? Are they Chaco people going down there and trading? I, I think so, I believe so. I believe Chaco was this huge trade center and you had outlying Pueblos, like the map I showed earlier. So uh, if you look at the peopling and the map and the people coming in uh, to the Chaco area, um, where get there, you know, how did, how did these feathers from Chaco get all the way to my village, way over in Santa Clara to the north? Here's Hamus, they were there. And we're down the other side of the, the volcano from Hamas. You're getting all these objects that were bought in Chaco showing up way up, even in Mesa Verde. And you've got Chimney Rock and, and uh, Aztec and Salmon all right here in concentration. And they're related to the, the royalty here in Chaco who had these elaborate turquoise masks, a lot like the jade masks you see in um, some of the Aztec and Mayan and Inca ruin sites. And green was more valuable than blue. A lot of people think blue turquoise is the bomb, but back then it was green. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of reasons why Chaco existed. One of them, again, eagles and, and turkeys, you're able to raise your herds, you're able to make those wonderful, tur those turkey feather blankets. You know, people think, look at look at the, the the cups and things coming out of Chaco. And there's that famous window, Nathan, being placed on cups, being placed on objects. 
You've got these, these uh, tick designs. These represent fields and water. Water's important. So they're talking about everything that they have there in that Chaco location. Anything used for water has rain, it has mountains, it has that macaw. Everything that they used had, had everything that had to do with, uh, you know, the, the transitions coming in to the culture is written on the pottery. It's written on the rock. Uh, so if you go to Chaco, look at not only the objects, but also the what's coming out of there, this great artwork, this great, great things. And it's being transferred all over in all four directions. And that highway to the north and to the south is so wide, it's bigger than our freeway. And the music that's coming out of there is also important because some of those songs and dances, uh, I still believe that we still hold those songs and dances within our own village systems. Uh, we've never forgotten our time there. And I think the Azteca people who traded with the Chaco cultures, I think that they still talk about that big village to the north that confused the Spaniards. Then they thought that was El Dorado. You know, there was this big village of these, these uh, two, three-story buildings. So the painted picture that people still hold is a magnificent story indeed. Make your way to Chaco, go see it, spend the night. Another important thing was the astronomical uh, properties in Chaco. So their village was not just made because it was a good location. It was based on lunar and Venus and solar design. So that way you could have passive solar. You could stay warm in the winter and stay cool in the summer. They were green builders. They knew architect. They also knew um, how to irrigate systems with very little water. They had cisterns, they had plumbing. They were impressive people. Um, and I'm proud to say that, you know, I am certainly taking them on as my relatives. Um, so when you look and you go to Chaco, make sure you see the night sky because that tells a lot about what they were seeing at night. You camp out there is a good trip if you decide to camp at Chaco. I would, and I'm going to again, and go to the observatory there. It's a magnificent place. Kate, anything else I can add? I love all the things that you've said. And I wanted to show people some of, to bring a visual to the kids who are watching right now. And kids, in your classrooms, you might be thinking things. You might be thinking, I have questions. I wonder this, I wonder that. When you go to Chaco today, it's built in a canyon, you know, Chaco Canyon. And in the center of the canyon is an old riverbed and it still floods when it rains. I'm sure Nathan can tell you all about how hard it is to get to Chaco after a big rain. And yet it's dry today. At the time, it, it was very likely not always dry. As Mary was pointing out, there's been climate change that has really changed how dry Chaco is today. I want to show just a few images that as you were talking, it made me think about. First of all, you mentioned Mary Wiaki, the archi the uh, astronomy of Chaco, the incredible astronomers. Um, Mary or Nathan, can you explain what are we looking at? It's not the greatest picture, but you can see there's a spiral. And this is a light, a beam of light. Can Mary or Mary or, or Nathan, can you explain what this is, one of you? Do you want to take that one, Mary? I'd like to hear your interpretation of it. <laughs> it is a calendar. So you see the circle and it goes from, uh, if you look at the interior of the circle and it goes out, what it's marking are solstice time periods. So you can even track today's uh, calendar by using these, uh, this dagger. But if you look at this dagger and you, and you make bone tools, it's like an awl or a needle. So it is a needle pointing a, like, a, a, like a solar, uh, what is it? Uh, 
the, the calendar's on a, on a sundial. It's a sundial, basically. So it's telling us what, what time of year to plant, what year, what day we should have our festivals. Um, it, it can even, even give you times of prediction. 2012 showed up on the solstice, on, on this dagger, which was an, uh, a time of transition of change. Um, unfortunately, uh, this is a little bit off because the mountain rocked and there's three slabs of stone that create that dagger and they're, they're laid uh, or stood up precisely in a way that the sun comes through them and creates that dagger. But so only on a certain day. Time is it only on the solstice that we see this dagger? Yeah, you'll see it come in during solstice. And the dagger's hidden up here, isn't it? It's somewhere in this butte. As yeah, I Pahada Butte, yeah. Not this is very beautiful when you go to Chaco. It's hard to see maybe from this picture, but this is all a valley. And the, the remains of the, of the buildings are down in this valley, but here on this butte is where the astronomical uh, monument. dagger, yeah, the monument is there. Mary, you mentioned Chaco chinks. I just had to bring this up because it's one of the most beautiful things in my mind about Chaco and its architecture. We see this, look at this beautiful architecture. It's rocks and then little tiny rocks. Can you imagine how long this took, how precise you had to be? And also look how beautiful it looks in the long run. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These chinks act as shock absorbers. So um, it was earthquake proof. So really? you, see, you see yeah. that ingenious, ingenious, uh, th think of what you had to do. Yes, yes. We talk about people from a thousand years ago as if, oh, they really didn't know anything yet. But look at how ingenious people were. That's not true. People had tremendously sophisticated skills in, in understanding geology. Let's look at another one. Uh, and I'm going to bring this into here. Yeah, this also shows the different architectural style. Notice it's a slightly different style here. It was evolving um, in the styles. And, and I, there, I found another one that I don't even know uh, where this one comes from, but maybe you can explain this, Mary. So this is, this is the earliest design. And the second one you showed is the next time period. And then oh. this one is the ultimate. So design. this is this is the ultimate. Yeah. This was the first. Yeah. And, and the, then this was the second. Second. Yeah. And that's how you know the change in, in style and time period. And that's why I'm saying uh, there's uh, design technology coming in. There's all these people with different ideas on how to build something. But mm. I love the chinks are my favorite. They're so beautiful, aren't they? Wow, it's really neat. And it, and it gives Chaco kind of that signature. Did we see that anywhere else around? It, it was replicated clearly elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You see it in a lot of the, the Kiva design bases. They didn't, instead of uh, destroying that old Kiva, they veneered it. So you veneered mean they coated like, it with another mm -hmm. layer of rocks? Yes, with an, another layer of engineering technology, a different layer. That's how we find occupation time periods. So we peel back and we expose, yes. Oh, so you as an archeologist, you come into a place like Chaco and you're, you're looking very differently from us as tourists, right? We're looking and we're just like, oh, we're so amazed. But you come in and you're seeing, hmm, what was under this? What was before this? Exactly. Hmm. You're seeing uh, you're seeing technological changes and the development of of the human nature coming in things. They're making things better and supposedly um, to last longer mm. and still keeping the old technology, which is following the sun and the and Venus and the moon. Which well, there, were, has done. there were clearly successful in making Chaco endure 
all this millennia, uh, in spite of people not even living there, it still endures, it's still there. And um, I want to ask a few, if the kids have any questions they'd like to pipe up with at this point, is there anyone out in our classrooms, you can come and unmute and ask your questions. Uh, I'm guessing you may have some questions and maybe I can help with thinking about what some of those questions would be. Why did people stop going to Chaco? What? It seems like it was abandoned at some point. Why? It was so beautiful. Seems like you could just build on top of it forever. What happened? Nathan, any you want to? Well, I've heard different theories. We do know that around the time when people started to leave, that did happen at the same time as a drought. So that's one theory, but there's lots of other theories. And I know modern Pueblo people have certain ideas and theories why people began to leave. But one thing that I've heard a lot of Pueblo people say is that we did not abandon Chaco Canyon. It's still oh. a very special place in their culture and in the story of their people. And they still come back and visit and they still use the canyon in different ways. But that's one thing I've been told m multiple times that we do not use the word abandon when we talk about Chaco Canyon today. But yeah, there's a lot of theories on why people left, but um, the, the drought is the only one that we can scientifically prove. But yeah, Mary probably has some other uh, theories that you know, come from, from her perspective as well. Well, the, uh, when you're looking at uh, the drought situation and where they were bringing in all those vegas from, they were bringing them in for a forest that's far away, hundred, a couple of hundred miles away. And uh, they pretty much used all their uh, plants and animals around them. They, you know, ate themselves out of existence, much like Mesa Verde did. You see a change in the fauna, which is animal remains in hearts. Um, you, when they start to eat all the rabbits and deer and antelope and buffalo and whatever's around them, that you start seeing uh, in the hearth turkeys, turkey bones. So that means, uh, uh, and dog bones. So that means a point of starvation and a desperate means of survival toward the end periods. Um, of, of water was, of course, uh, a factor. And when the drought came, that drought wasn't just the one year or two year drought. How about 11 to 15 years, possibly, that there was no water, no rain, uh, and the uh, people were losing faith, uh, royalty passing away made it even more um, uh, of a, a time where, okay, well, maybe it's time to move on. So they moved, but like Nathan said, we never forgot that that place was a sacred place. And we still leave our cornmeal offerings there, or we go pray and sing songs and honor the old ones. Um, we do that with all our um, uh, village sites that we had to leave during the time of the great drought. And they gathered in places where there was uh, springs that were still alive. Mm. Interesting. How, he's, I get a question here. How were the ah. things made? Lots of lots of questions. Actually, there's so many questions. Um, the kids have a ton of questions. They clay. Yes, let's talk tools, and then we'll come back to the second set of questions. So, Raíz de Estel Sabor is down in um, Las Cruces, New Mexico, and those kids have a lot of questions too. And this is one of them. How were the tools made, Mary? They were made of stone still. So here I have a hammer that was used as an ax for cutting wood. And I've got uh, this hammer end. And we're using an oak handle with rawhide on it. Uh, it and, it's, and it's a split wood handle. And it's called hafting on the stone. So the physics behind this stone is so cool. This is a very dense basalt hammer, but because this is flexible, this can bend and then thrust 
the stone. So the stone's doing all the work. You're just basically just holding it. And I have a tree stump that I used to carry around. Um, and I would ask the kids, how long do you think it would take to cut a tree about the diameter, maybe 12 inch diameter uh, in, uh, down with this hammer? And a lot of them say, oh, two days, three days. But how about 20 minutes? What? Wait, how? Wait. Because the stone is doing all the work. So it's cutting the green stone. And it's an incredible technology. Um, it would take me a lot longer than 20 minutes. I'm just yeah. going to say. But clearly I'm using bad tools. That's... <laughs> Yeah, stone tools were still in effect. Basketry for hauling the dirt to create. The women carried uh, uh, baskets of stone. So if you look from uh, Pueblo Bonito and you look south, you'll see these mounds that look identical. That is handmade by women Whoa. carrying baskets and baskets of dirt. Amazing. It's incredible what people do. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so so many good questions here. How did the people of Chaco make their clay? They made clay out of uh, different uh, rock sediments using ant rock. You know how ants make this beautiful mound and they have all those uh, quartzite crystals and different granites on there. They would take those uh, from the uh, ants and then re-crush them on matates and that was the temper temper is what makes this hard and it makes during the firing it holds the clay together clay if you were just to make it from the creek that was down there there's several clay pits in chaco so they would uh take that mud and um, clean it and take out all the debris like stones and roots and whatnot and then mix that temper from the ants and then make this so hard. Even if I drop this, sometimes it bounces and you can you can do a rescue catch with these, but they're really neat pieces. Incredible. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't get the second question quite. Can you live? Oh, can you live there? Can you live there in Chaco? Does anyone live in Chaco, Nathan? Does anyone live in Chaco? Well, some of the park rangers still live in the, in the canyon. We do have housing and we have staff who live down there. We have park rangers like myself who talk to the public and give tours. But then we have people who clean bathrooms and make sure that, uh, you know, the, you know, all the facilities are working properly. We have archaeologists and administrative people who uh, do all the things that we need to have to make the national park function. Mm -hmm. So, there are a few folks that still live down there and I've gotten to stay down there uh, occasionally off and on since I've been working for these parks. And one thing that Mary mentioned that I also want to emphasize to stay overnight at Chaco is an amazing experience because not only is Chaco a national park, it's an international dark sky park because it's so isolated. We don't have a lot of, what we call light pollution. So if you go to a big city like Albuquerque or even a medium sized city like Farmington, you have gas stations and shopping centers where their lights are on all night. And when the lights are on all night, the sky is not as dark. And when the sky is not as dark, you can't see a lot of stuff. You know, I grew up near San Diego, California, where there's millions and millions of people. And I would go outside as a kid and I could look up and see the stars. And I thought I had seen what a night sky should look like. And then I spent the night at Chaco Canyon. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've been missing this my whole life. The stars are so much brighter. You can see the Milky Way. You can see planets if they're in the sky that night. And there's so many shooting stars. And if you're in an area with light pollution, shooting stars are happening all the time but you might not see them because it's too bright. But at Chaco, because it's so remote and it's so dark, you get to see a night sky that's pretty amazing. So the people that get to live down there, you know, it's, it's isolated, 
But I think they're pretty lucky because they get to see that beautiful night sky all the time. So if you do have an opportunity to camp, I highly recommend it. So no one's really living there in the buildings, though. And I, I think that that's we want to preserve the buildings. And when you go to Chaco and visit, all of us get to go see all these buildings. But we all need to be very, very careful to leave only our footprints behind. And the other thing about Chaco is there are a lot of artifacts, you know, pot shards and arrowheads and all kinds of, and they're everywhere. And the best rule, and I really want to make sure everyone understands this, do not take them. You can look at them. You can take a picture, but do not take them. And you must put them back right where you found them because what you don't know is, is there more of that story right underneath that pot shard or underneath that bone or whatever you find? And if you move it, that story gets lost. So leave it. And this is true wherever you are. If you see artifacts anywhere, it's good to take a picture. And that's it. Do not take the artifact. Actually, I've heard it's bad luck for like the right. You'll be cursed if you take stuff. So I, I know that's just superstition, but it's good enough for me. I leave everything and I take pictures. And that's what I urge you to do too. Lots more questions from the kids. Mary, let's come to you for this one. What kind of clothes did people wear at Chaco? And, and, and how did it change from, I would say from 20,000 years ago, when you showed us the shoes people were wearing down 23,000 years, what, what kind of clothes did people wear? People were growing cotton by then. So you have a lot of cotton uh, uh, mantas or, or uh, tunics that the men wore. Of course, yucca sandals were still in fashion, believe it or not, uh, until the Athabascans bring in moccasin technology. But basically, people were still wearing sandals. Um, there was a, someone asked a question about children's items, uh, toys. You find children's toys that you think aren't children's toys. Remember um, back then the kids, a small uh, pebble or stick or something, uh, there were certain toys uh, that were uh, like a spindle whirl on a string that used to sing. Those were toys. There were also string games that were taught at night that the children learned about um, making uh string games, talking about the mountain ranges, talking about lessons learned. So there were children night games there as well. And, and you find these uh, remnants, but uh, when you find a little child's toy, like a sandal, maybe you can't help but think about the kids. There were children there. And we always just think about us adults, how boring. The kids were the ones having the most fun. Probably so. And when you're at Chaco, some of the little doorways are really, really small. And I've thought to myself, wow, this would be such a great place to play hide and seek. If you were a child, you'd have so much fun. You'd have to say, we have to limit it to this section because you could probably never find the person. Um, turkey feathers, blankets and rabbit fur blankets were still the fashion as well. This doesn't end until probably 13, 1400s. You're talking 20,000 plus years of yeah, excellent warm technology that yeah. works great. Yeah, so you still have uh, the, the turkey feathers coming in. And if you go to Chaco and the museum opens, my turkey feather blanket's in one of the cases. Ooh. So look at that. And so you got that. And never forget the rabbit fur blanket. We're all never going to forget that rabbit fur blanket, which we can all imagine how wonderful that must feel to be all over you. Did you ever find a piece of jewelry? This is a question from the kids down in um, Las Cruces. Did you ever find a piece of jewelry that had both jade and turquoise? There was small fragments of jade and turquoise. Um, in, especially in the collection of the royalties. There were a royal family that was buried, a mother and her sons and daughters that had the largest collection of turquoise and ornaments ever found uh, in an excavation site. And Nathan, you can probably talk more about that. 
Yeah, I'm not sure about the uh, the jade. Jade. Got a lot of turquoise uh, necklaces, multiple strands, and one of the most um, famous uh, finds was a, a jet frog made from jet black stone, and it's inlaid with a turquoise collar. And it's pretty large. It's about the size of a fist. And it's I've only seen pictures of it, but it, it's beautiful. So the craftsmanship of some of the jewelry that they found was just amazing. And I was told that near Fahada Butte, the uh, location of the Sun Dagger, that very near there, there were turquoise workshops where jewelers were making some of these uh, beautiful uh, necklaces and other ornaments. So turquoise, there's a lot of it in Chaco Canyon. And it sounds like there may have been some jade as well, but the turquoise is, is pretty phenomenal, the amount of turquoise they found in some of these buildings. Is this the there's frog? The frog. Oh, wow. If That's you, cool. If you look at the ant mounds, sometimes you'll see little turquoise beads in there. Really? They bring in it up from the un under under the ground. And so cool. I, I always stop and look at the ant mounds. I've learned so much from you about ant mounds this morning. I hope everybody else did too. Like taking ant mounds and making clay out of it is pretty cool. Um, food. You talked a little bit about food and how they made food in those vessels they were able to touch. So they were cooking. They had fires. They had hearths. They were hunting. They were growing food. Is that about right? Any, and they were clearly making food using these wonderful tools that they had. Kitchenware. Yeah, they had cookware. They definitely had cookware. Mm -hmm. And uh, the corrugated pot, the one I showed you earlier uh, with uh, this, this smaller color, and then it goes to the full corrugation model. So experimentation, final product. So this, uh, corrugated pot becomes a, a very valuable cooking vessel. Um, again, you're talking about um, uh, what we think is food, you know, uh, cows, um, uh, pig, uh, chicken, none of that existed. Uh, so you're, they're having to survive on rabbit. If they killed a deer, that was wonderful because that's a large uh, uh, animal. Uh, and it could feed lots of people, but mainly they survived off beans, corns, and squash. The three sisters in combination together is the best protein source you can possibly eat. Uh, meat was a luxury. They ate rodents. So you had muskrat on the menu. You had mice on the menu. You had, you know, other uh, possible rodents on the menu as prairie dogs were popular, but you used all the pelts. I've seen uh, uh, rodent pelts turned into these beautiful cloaks that they gave to the medicine people. They were special. Can you imagine having a cloak made with a thousand rabbit, I mean, a mouse fur, uh, deer mice in particular, deer mouse pelts? I want to know if the kids think that's a good idea. You can respond in the chat. Would you wear that? Would you wear it to school? Would you? I'm. <laughs> You would. I might. Yeah. And, you know, I bet it was furry and soft. If you've ever pet a mouse, they're really actually very soft and furry. Can we explain the name, Chaco? The NACA schools are asking um, here in Albuquerque, why the name Chaco? What is there a Chaco person or a cow? Oh, what? No, you mean it's named Chocolate? This whole time it's Chocolate Canyon? Chacao. Chacao. I did not know that. I hope you, like me, are learning something new every day, <laughs> like right this minute. Um, some said no. Depends on the feeling of it, the, the mouse jacket. I'd like to hear from other kids, too. Would you wear a mouse shirt, coat? Some say yes. Some say no. How does it feel, Mary? Is it soft and it's adorable? soft? It's very soft. Once once a pelt is tanned, um, it becomes pliable and soft, and 
you know, it's just the beautiful, the colors of a mouse are beautiful. If you really, really looked at a mouse or a prairie dog and, and said, God, how pretty, I mean, I'd like to wear that, you know, it, it kind of like Carmilla, Car Carilla DeVille from Disney, <laughs> right? I want those puppies. <laughs> They're probably pretty soft. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I really love that. And, you know, it's worth mentioning too. They they didn't have puppies. They didn't have cats no, no, and no. dogs. We're not talking a culture that had pets. They had dogs. Yeah. Talk dogs, more about that. Dogs and turkeys were the only domestic animal that the Pueblo people had. And the dogs, you traveled with 2,000 dogs. Whoa, because whoa, whoa. No horse. There's you, no horses. So your dogs carried everything for you. Do we they, know that the dogs carried everything? Do you find these packs that are for dogs? You find your voice uh, implements that were used for dogs. And in burials, you find dogs. And some protected Kiva sites, some were uh, guardians to take you uh, off on your journey to cross. Dogs were very important as much as the turkey. I love that. <laughs> I love that. A really good question here. Um, I love this question from NACA. Since there were royal families, has there been evidence of slaves and workers? And were there differences in the housing? Like were the royal houses bigger and nicer and better? Of course, the Kardashians had it all. <laughs> the Kardashian yes, royalty Chicago. is what it's it is you know you were given special privilege you know you were given the best you were gifted these wonderful items um that come in uh so you had to look at them as yes they did have slaves there was trade of peopling um sometimes if you couldn't uh pay your gambling debt you had to trade your kid in you oh. know so you had to think about these kinds of things that were occurring within the systems. People always say, no, there weren't slaves, but there were, there were trading of humans, believe me. Do we know where those humans came from? They're, they they would be like, you know, sorry, Mary, I can't pay you. You could better take my kid over here. It could have just been peer to peer people in the same community or would the people who were not the royalty from somewhere else, were they considered others, outsiders? Do we they know? They were coming from the outside. So, you know, you see a lot of these uh, uh, taking in of other uh, peoples to, uh, to work for you. So those villages are on the outside of the main village. At least you were given a place for sustainability because they needed you. You know, they needed your help to help build these marvelous structures. So they really uh, didn't, they didn't completely take their freedoms away. Let me put it that way. You were, you were given that choice to, to work and live, but you could never claim that bloodline. You know, you were an, an outside. So that's why those outside villages come in, come in and go. Hmm. But um Wow. So it, when you talk about royalty and the kids didn't ask this, but I'm wondering if anyone else is wondering this, wait, who are these royalty? Do we know who these people are? Why they were considered royalty? Does such a, I know Chaco clearly had quite a sophisticated governmental structure. That yes, it was, uh, it was the women who were in charge. There was no um, patriarchal society. So men were often, uh, put to the back of the of the classroom, so to speak, and the women uh, made a lot of the religious th decisions. And uh, the woman who who passed, who was royalty, was indeed, you know, a powerful uh, part of that Chaco culture. And her daughter was held in the same regard. And if you look at the items that the mother and daughter had compared to the son, there the mother and daughter had greater numbers. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, uh, the Europeans come in and give uh, a different uh, view of how women uh, should be uh, put in political systems. But that's, at this point, we didn't have that. 
Oh we, no, we we were the bomb, man. We were we were the the we were the bomb, man. We were the rulers. Well, we did have the babies, so it kind of we made were, us. Really we were stuck. life givers. We were considered. Uh, we were life givers, and that's a precious gift that anybody can give you is life. Great question here from Naka as well, um, and lots more questions too. Uh, I hope I got them all. Um, how many people lived at Chaco? And this kind of brings up the, how many people lived at Chaco at its sort of when everyone was there having a ceremony? Cause I know that people came and went from Chaco, right? So what was the sort of main core population? And then when everyone would come for the big solstice, how many people? Yeah, Nathan, go ahead. That's a good question. And when Chaco is rediscovered, in the late 1800s, they found these giant buildings. And a lot of those uh, early explorers thought that, wow, here's a giant building. It's got four or 500 rooms. There must be thousands of people living in all of these giant buildings. And then as archeologists got smarter, they began to realize that there wasn't a lot of other evidence that would support a year round large population. And so then the thinking began to shift that you might have had a year round population of maybe just a few thousand people in the entire canyon. But as you recognize, Katie, during a special event or a ceremony like solstice or equinox, you might have people coming from great distances, 50, 60 miles or more to come and stay in the canyon for those celebrations and they might stay for a few weeks or longer and then once those celebrations were over they might go back to their year-round homes but i've seen a lot of debate about actually how many people lived in the canyon year-round and i think current research tells us that it might have been a few thousand but not this enormous population that people thought in the early days when they first started to rediscover these giant buildings. Yeah, sounds about right. Mary, Mary you're nodding, so you agree, it seems like. Yeah, I agree. There's a, the population is, ba remember that when you look at those structures, they were mainly for sleeping because uh, and didn't cook inside the structures. And so you slept in there. So you can take one small room block and estimate how many people can fit in it based on the size of the human at that time period. We're bigger now. We were pretty small. We were like averaging four foot three, maybe even smaller as a, as a full grown adult. Really? Yeah. That's wow. why those doorways, you know, are pretty small. I just banged my head. I went there yeah. last week and so I just now, banged yeah. my head into the door. Yeah. Who told so her taco? The nutrition change in, in us, even now today, you know, we're eating better, uh, we're eating more proteins. So then now we're getting to be larger humans. Where back then, you're vegetarians eating corn, beans, and squash, but still getting protein, but not animal protein. So your body structure is a lot smaller. So that's why it's still impressive that such these humans were able to carry these massive logs and things. But uh, the population, you can pretty much uh, get, get an estimate by... Um, you know, how many people can you fit in that Volkswagen, you know? <laughs> well, that is interesting because when you see these rooms and you go to Chaco, some are indeed very, very small mm -hmm. and they're dark because it was apartment style. So there's some, and you have to think like, boy, I would not want to be in that downstairs with no windows. And it's only this little teeny weeny room. But now Remember the downstairs, the downstairs areas were storage because they, oh. they, they stayed cooler. Everything upstairs was where human slept and did everything else. And downstairs had no windows or doors or you had to come in from the top. So that way rodents and other things didn't get into whatever you were storing in those in those little rooms. It makes you know, me feel much better about Chaco. Yeah. I can imagine people <laughs> having to sleep in those dark little basement rooms. Oh, Sounds okay. much better. Now yeah. I'm like, oh, well, now I can see why you'd go for a summer 
getaway <laughs> to Chaco, an important religious excursion, really. Well, we have run out of time, but boy, wow. I hope everyone has learned as much as I've learned today from our guest, Nathan Hatfield, who is the interpretive. And Nathan, I'm going to get your name wrong here, or your title wrong, but essentially you're the head interpretive ranger at Chaco Culture National Park. And if you want to go to Chaco and learn a lot, Nathan has, with his team, created such wonderful brochures and handouts. You can get a lot of help looking around Chaco with these guides to help you really understand what you're looking at. Mary Wiaki has also been our guest and a true friend of the Children's Hour. Mary Wiaki is an archaeologist with the Center for Archaeological Research up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And again, our program was generously funded by the New Mexico Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as by the listeners and supporters of the Children's Hour Incorporated. We have been uh, live streaming this to YouTube. Thanks to all of our viewers on YouTube and all the kids in the room here today. Thank you all so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Thanks. 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 And, and next time, folks, we're going to meet in about a month on May 16th on a Monday morning at 10 a.m. We're going to talk with people about that moment that Mary mentioned when the Europeans came. They actually met people. We're going to talk with some of the folks whose ancestors met those Spanish who came up from the South and find out what that encounter was like. What happened when East meets West or when the Spanish came in? We want to know that story. What exactly did happen? when that day happened. It's interesting. We're going to be with the um, Ashiwi, and I hope I'm saying this properly, the Ashiwi folks, which is also called Zuni Pueblo. They have a wonderful museum out there, and they actually have items in that museum from, as they like to say, that day. There really was a day where people came up over the horizon who had never been here before. We're going to learn about that and see what that did. How did that impact the people already living here, the culture, the civilizations? We know a little hint from Mary that the, the system where women were ruling and running everything got questioned in that moment because suddenly the fellas saw a different way of doing things as my guess <laughs> and we're going to learn a lot more about that i hope you'll join us please go to childrenshour.org slash history to learn more about this project thank you all for being with us today i sure appreciate everyone thank you to all the kids in class we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we hope you've learned a lot take care